Welcome to IGCSE Chemistry, Topic 3, Part 2, Chemistry of Three Gases, Oxygen, Carbon Dioxide and Hydrogen. The composition of the air. If we take a look at the approximate percentages by volume of the main gases present in unpolluted dry air, then we see that nitrogen makes up roughly 78.1% of the air, uh, oxygen 21%, argon 0.9%, and carbon dioxide 0.04%. There are other small traces of other noble gases also in the air. Notice that we are talking about dry air as air can contain anywhere up to 4% water vapour and also we are talking about unpolluted air um, as the pollution will add in small amounts of other gases. We're going to begin by taking a look at oxygen, formula O2 has six electrons on the outside shell forming two covalent bonds to make a diatomic molecule which is O2. Oxygen makes up 21% or roughly one-fifth of the air. There are two methods which would allow us to measure the amount of oxygen in the air and hopefully to prove that there is in fact 21% oxygen in the air. The first method for determining how much oxygen is in the air involves the apparatus shown here. We have two gas syringes connected to a silica tube which looks like glass in which is placed some copper. The copper is heated strongly with a Bunsen burner while at the same time the air is pushed back and forth um, using the gas syringes pushing from left to right, right to left so that the air and the oxygen in the air can pass over the copper. As the air passes over the copper the oxygen reacts with the copper forming black copper 2 oxide. The volume in the gas syringes continues to fall. Eventually all the oxygen is used up in the air and the volume stops contracting. We will have no copper left, it will all have turned to black copper oxide. On cooling what we can find out is that 79% um, of the gas that was originally in the syringes is now left behind. So assuming we started with 100 centimetres cubed of air in the gas syringes, we will have 79 centimetres cubed of gas remaining, which means that 21 centimetres cubed, or 21% of the air, has been used up. This showing that 21% of the air was in fact oxygen. The second method for determining how much oxygen is in the air involves producing rust from iron. As you can see from the diagram, Damp iron wool is placed at the bottom of a test tube. The test tube is inverted under water. The remainder of the test tube is filled with air. A rubber band is used to show where the initial starting place of the air was. You then leave the test tube for a week, in which time the oxygen will react with the iron, producing iron oxide or hydrated iron oxide, which is uh, rust, and the volume inside the test tube of gas will decrease. Once the experiment is over, we can fill the test tube um, with water and measure the volume of water that was used, moving from the initial rubber band to the final rubber band position, and this will show us how much of the air has been used up. If, for example, we originally had 15 centimetres cubed of air in the test tube and the final volume was roughly 12 centimetres cubed, then we could see that the oxygen used up measured roughly 3 centimetres cubed. We could work a percentage out. So it will be 3 centimetres cubed divided by 15 centimetres cubed times by 100 will give us 20% of the air that was in the test tube was oxygen. We can make oxygen in the laboratory. There is an easy method involving hydrogen peroxide solution or H2O2 aqueous and to it we add manganese 4 oxide as a catalyst. It is a catalytic decomposition reaction that takes place, which means that the catalyst decomposes or breaks down the hydrogen peroxide, and we form water and the gas oxygen. The oxygen is collected through water displacement. Um, there is a delivery tube which will travel underwater. A inverted test tube will be placed under the water, filled with filled with water. As the gas is produced, it will rise to the top of the test tube and displace the water. We can prove that the gas that we've collected is in fact oxygen by lighting a splint, blowing it out so that it's glowing and then placing this glowing splint into the test tube with the gas inside. If the gas is oxygen then the splint will relight. 
so we're relighting a glowing splint to test for oxygen gas. Oxygen combines with many elements to form oxides. For example, we can form iron oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, magnesium oxide. Elements that burn in air can also be burned in pure oxygen and the reactions can be compared. For example, if magnesium is burnt in air, it will uh, produce a bright white flame and produce a white powdery ash of magnesium oxide. The reaction is very similar when magnesium is burnt in pure oxygen, except that we get an extremely bright flame this time round. If we have a rapid reaction with the oxygen in the air, or with a pure oxygen, and heat is released, then we refer to this as burning. Burning is very useful. Uh, when we take carbon, for example in the form of coal, and it is burnt in oxygen, we produce a yellow-orange flame, um, and we produce the colourless gla the gas, carbon dioxide. Sulphur can also be burnt in air. This is seen as a blue flame. We produce the colourless gas, sulphur dioxide, which is poisonous. If we return to look at the oxides that were produced in the three reactions we have just discussed, then we can see that magnesium oxide, like most metal oxides, are almost insoluble in water. However, when small amounts do dissolve in water, they produce a slightly alkali solution. In this case, magnesium oxide will dissolve in water to produce magnesium hydroxide. So we can say that metal oxides, if they dissolve in water, will produce an alkaline solution. If we compare to non-metal oxides, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, when these non-metal oxides dissolve in water, they react to produce an acidic solution. In the case of sulfur, we produce sulfurous acid, H2SO3. Note this is different from sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. With carbon, carbon dioxide dissolves to some extent in water to produce a slightly acidic solution. This is a similar pattern that we will see with other non-metal oxides. Do not assume that all non-metal oxides are acidic. A few are neutral. A good example is water, which is hydrogen oxide. Another example would be carbon monoxide. So in summary, most metal oxides do either react with or dissolve in water. Those that do tend to form alkaline solutions. Non-metal oxides often react with water to form acidic solutions. Common exceptions are water and carbon monoxide. Let's take a closer look at some of the environmental impacts of these non-metal oxides. We will begin with carbon dioxide. Energy from the sun travels to earth, is absorbed by the earth's surface and is re-emitted in the form of infrared radiation. Some of the infrared energy is absorbed by molecules such as carbon dioxide. Uh, this energy can then be transferred to other molecules in the atmosphere, slowly warming up the whole atmosphere. This is, of course, a process that has been going on for a long time. And in fact, without the presence of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then our planet would possibly um, lose too much of the heat and therefore not maintain a temperature which could sustain life. There are numerous arguments and models being produced which explain and project the effect of the increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere due to human um, consumption of fossil fuels. I recommend that you use the internet to find out the latest information as it is a field which is rapidly changing. Let's take a look at the other non-metal oxides and their impact on the environment. The two that we're going to focus on are sulfur dioxide and the oxides of nitrogen. Acid rain is produced when sulfur dioxide, SO2 and various nitrous oxides, often shown as NOXX, indicating a number, uh, dissolve in water droplets in the atmosphere. The burning of fossil fuels at power stations and factories and also from the engines of motor vehicles produce these um, oxides. Fossil fuels often contain the sulfur which is then burned to produce sulfur dioxide. Um, great effort is being made to remove the sulphur either from the fuel at the beginning of the burning process or uh, scrubbers are used which help remove the carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides uh, once 
the fuel has been burnt. So many factories and power stations and cars are fitted with devices to help reduce the amount of sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides going into the atmosphere. The very high temperatures inside the internal combustion engine, inside of cars or motorbikes and lorries etc. Um, provides enough energy for the nitrogen in the air to react with the oxygen producing the nitrogen oxides. Both nitrogen oxide and the sulfur dioxide form acid rain by dissolving in the water droplets in the air. The acid rain can damage plants and trees, it can affect the pH of lakes and rivers, altering um, the pH has a big impact on aquatic life. Many buildings which are made from limestone and some which are made of metal uh, can begin to be attacked by the acid in the acid rain. To reduce the effect of these pollutants, vehicles in Europe by law are fitted with catalytic converters. These react with the exhaust gases coming out of the back of the vehicle and they can take things like nitrogen oxides, convert them to nitrogen gas. However, they have no effect on the sulfur dioxide. The catalytic converters work best when very hot, so longer journeys are very effective at reducing the amount of pollution coming from the exhaust of a car. Very short inner city journeys mean that the catalytic converter will not reach temperature or reaction temperature and therefore will be less effective at removing the nitrogen oxides from the exhaust fumes. Our next gas is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a covalently bonded molecule. We have a carbon atom with two covalent bonds to each of the oxygens. So in total there are four covalent bonds in a molecule of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a number of uses, one of which is to produce carbonated or fizzy drinks. Carbon dioxide will dissolve in water when under pressure. When you open the bottle or the can, the pressure falls and the gas bubbles come out of solution. Two factors affect the amount of carbon dioxide that will dissolve. First one is pressure. The higher the pressure, the more carbon dioxide that will dissolve. And temperature, the lower the temperature, the more carbon dioxide that will dissolve. You've probably experienced this in real life. If, for example, in the summer you open up a fizzy drink and leave it outside in the sun, as it warms up, it will become flatter than if you had done the same on a colder day. Carbon dioxide can also be used in fire extinguishers to put out electrical fires or fires that are caused by a burning liquid when water would not be a suitable um, extinguisher. The gas is denser than air and so sinks down onto the flames and prevents oxygen from getting to the burning material, the fuel, and therefore putting the fire out. Let's take a look how to make carbon dioxide in the lab. Carbon dioxide can be made easily by reacting an acid with a metal carbonate. For example, calcium carbonate, CaCO3, can be reacted with hydrochloric acid to produce a salt, calcium chloride, water and also carbon dioxide gas. To test for carbon dioxide, we can bubble it through lime water. Lime water is calcium hydroxide. When calcium hydroxide solution, which to begin with is a clear colour solution, reacts with the carbon dioxide gas, we form a white precipitate of calcium carbonate and we also produce water. So the solution of lime water goes from clear colourless to milky or cloudy white. Another method for producing carbon dioxide is through the thermal decomposition of metal carbonates. So for example, if we take sodium carbonate, magnesium carbonate and zinc carbonate and we heat it strongly then the heat will cause the decomposition or the breakdown of the metal carbonate releasing carbon dioxide gas and a metal oxide. One way of telling that there is a thermal decomposition reaction taking place is that you will have only one reactant before the arrow in an equation. If we take a sample of metal carbonate and weigh it before thermally decomposing it by heating it, what we will see is that as the carbon dioxide gas is allowed to escape, the weight of the sample will decrease. One example is the use of copper carbonate, which starts out as a green powder. If we heat this green copper carbonate powder, it thermally decomposes to produce a black powder, which is copper oxide, and we also produce our carbon dioxide gas.
However, the Bunsen burner is not hot enough to decompose some metal carbonates. For example, uh, the group 1 metal carbonate, potassium carbonate, will not decompose using a Bunsen burner flame. Our third and final gas is hydrogen gas, H2. It's a diatomic molecule. It has covalent bonding between it. Each hydrogen atom has one electron in its outer shell and they share electrons to form a covalent bond. Hydrogen is a colourless, odourless, highly explosive gas which is much less dense than air. Hydrogen has such a low density that any hydrogen that is produced will leave the planet's atmosphere and enter space. Hydrogen has a number of uses. Hydrogen can be reacted with oxygen in a combustion reaction, releasing a lot of energy and only producing water as a byproduct. Therefore, if hydrogen can be used as a fuel and stored in vehicles, then we can reduce the amount of pollution being given out by motor vehicles. Hydrogen gas can be produced in the laboratory using the similar method that was seen in the production of carbon dioxide and oxygen through displacement of water. The hydrogen can be made by reacting a metal, for example zinc, with an acid, for example sulfuric acid. We will produce a salt in this case of zinc sulfate and also hydrogen gas which we can collect. The hydrogen which is produced can be tested using a lit splint. So take a splint, set it on fire, put it into the test tube containing the gas, the hydrogen will ignite and you will hear a squeaky pop. How can we prove that the gas being produced from the combustion of hydrogen is in fact just pure water? There are two methods. The first one to prove that water is present is to add a few drops of the liquid to an hydrous copper sulfate. So an anhydrous copper sulfate means that it does not have water. If water is present then the grey white anhydrous copper sulfate will turn blue. We can also test to see whether this water is in fact pure by testing its melting and boiling point. Pure water should boil at exactly 100 degrees Celsius and pure water should also freeze at exactly 0 degrees Celsius. Using these two methods we can prove that the product produced from the combustion of hydrogen is in fact pure water.